Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers for organizing this meeting. And it's very nice to see all these results and to actually catch up with many of you on the chat. Um, yeah, so my name is Jorot Maté. I'm a Zwicky Fellow at ETH in Zurich in Switzerland. And today I'll actually present some results uh, looking at luminous Lyman alpha emitters in the Epoch of Reionization, uh, mostly with the Muse GTO team, uh, partly at ETH. So these objects that I'm studying are um, selected to be, they are selected to be strong Lyman alpha emitters with narrow band surveys based on uh, ground-based telescopes that observe very wide areas on the sky, a uh, few times the, the full moon. And these objects, of course, are a biased sample of the high redshift galaxy population, but they are a sample that you can observe easily um, with spectra, because you know that there is an emission line by selection, and you also know where the emission line is. And particularly if you do this for a wide field area, you, you select bright objects. So these are some, some of the objects that we found and, and confirmed the redshift for over the years. Um, you can all see very high signal to noise Lyman alpha spectra. Um, and just some general overview on these properties. So by selection, I think these galaxies reside in highly ionized regions, perhaps bubbles at the end stages of the epoch of reionization, because otherwise we would not see their Lyman alpha line with such high luminosity. The intergalactic medium would have uh, uh, rescattered the line out of the line of, line of sight. Um, and the most extreme example of this object, of this kind of scenario is this object Cola 1, discovered by Hu et al, uh, the team in, in Hawaii um, in 2016. And we observed this galaxy um, later with higher resolution and better signal to noise to actually confirm that this is a double peaked Lyman alpha emitter at redshift 6.59. It's very high. It's one of the few uh, double peaked Lyman alpha emitters known. It was the first one to be confirmed to be that at such high redshift. And the fact that you can see the blue peak of the Lyman alpha line really indicates that, that this galaxy is in a highly ionized region that's very large, uh, large enough to redshift to allow the blue, even the blue Lyman alpha photos to redshift out of the resonant frequency of the intergalactic medium. Um, so that means that this galaxy actually already traces how, how what, what the kind of bubble sizes are. Of course, those sizes are a bit uncertain, but this is really tracing uh, reionization. Um, in addition to that, the peak separation of the Lyman alpha line um, it's a very good indicator of Lyman continuum leakage. And as seen in low redshift analogs of high redshift galaxies, this uh, Lyman continuum leakers are all double peaked. And the peak separation, the velocity separation of these lines uh, correlates with the escape fraction of ionizing photons. Uh, for this galaxy, which is actually a very bright galaxy um, and it's compact, the escape fraction is actually, inferred escape fraction is very high. So this means that we are directly witnessing a galaxy contributing to realization. That's nice. Um, looking a bit more into what are these kind of galaxies, um, I think many studies are now finding that luminous Lyman break galaxies and, and Lyman alpha emitters, with the samples overlap, um, consist of clumps in the UV continuum and as seen by Hubble and in the carbon-2 emission as seen uh, by ALMA. And I think some objects actually show dust continuum at different locations of the UV continuum as well. And these are clumps on two kiloparsec resolutions. And that resolution is not very high, I would say. Um, so these galaxies are really um, complex structures uh, that are assembling together. And it makes the spectroscopic follow-up a bit more challenging, because you actually really need IFUs to, to be sure that you're observing uh, the actual clump that you, you want to look at. Um, and in this talk, I want to present some results on MUSE observations of this galaxy CR7 that we discovered in 2015 um, is a nice artist impression. The galaxy consists of three components in the UV continuum, basically three complexes of star formation. Um, already from the ground-based Subaru narrowband imaging, we saw extended Lyman alpha emission in green on this uh, image. Um, this galaxy is particularly interesting because it's one of the brightest Lyman alpha emitters at this high redshift. When we initially found it, it was a good candidate for hosting stars with properties that were predicted to be um, for population tree stars. In particular, the absence of metal lines uh, and this tentative helium-2 line. Uh, of course, signal to noise is not great. You would like to reobserve this. Uh, but it's still, um, this is 
a bit interesting because immediately when we found this, it's also a bit of a mystery why you can get such a, high, uh, a massive and bright galaxy to um, host these uh, first generation or very uh, low metallicity stars because the universe is 600 million years old, but there's still, there's still quite a lot of time that you need to um, make sure that the gas is not polluted by metals from earlier star formation. Uh, so it's kind of a, a problem, perhaps. Um, and the other more empirical issue with this object is that all the similar objects in terms of luminosity that you observe at later points in cosmic time uh, are AGN and they're not powered by star formation. Um, I think the, the, the hypothesis that this galaxy is dominated by population three stars was ruled out most convincingly by these re resolved carbon two line emission observations um, that we presented in 2017. And this image shows the UV continuum again, but in the contours, you can see carbon two emission from the interstellar medium. It overlaps with various UV components and it, it's actually seen at multiple velocities, but that, that's shown by the, uh, by the different uh, colors. Um, on the scales of the, symbol of, these, uh, of the resolution of these observations, which is really about two kiloparsec, the interstellar medium seems to be relatively normal in terms of the metallicity. Of 0.1 solar. Of course, this is not a super accurate metallicity from these, this line. Um, but it, in general, I think it really shows that these galaxies are complex assembling uh, structures. Um, and with MUSE, so with the MUSE GTO, we actually wondered what can we learn from the Lyman alpha emission from this galaxy? So we knew that Lyman alpha emission was extended from the narrow band imaging, and we knew it was bright and narrow. Uh, but with the MUSE IFU, what, what that instrument allows you is to basically get a spectrum for each pixel. I'll show that later. Um, and we observed this with, uh, with the ground layer AO, which means that we actually got a very good resolution and uh, definitely, definitely resolving these different components that you see in the UV continuum. Um, so yeah, this is basically the grid. You can imagine that basically for each point, each cell in this grid, we actually get an independent Lyman alpha um, spectrum. And the questions that we are asking um, are, where does the Lyman alpha really originate? Which of these components is, is causing it? And how extended is the Lyman alpha emission? And in particular, how does this low surface brightness Lyman alpha emission compare to other galaxies? Um, just to show this very quickly, this is basically an optimal Lyman alpha image that's constructed with the IFU. Um, you can see here in black contours, the UV continuum with the same convolved to the same resolution. And in the colors, you see the Lyman alpha emission. You can see in red, it peaks at the, at the center where, where basically most of the star formation is happening. Um, but it's really extended up to 15 kiloparsec scales. Um, and each of these apertures, you can actually get spectra. Um, in these spectra, I don't want to discuss them in detail, um, but you can see carbon two in green and then Lyman alpha in the, uh, the black uh, uh, without any color. And you can see velocity offsets between Lyman alpha and the systemic are changing throughout the system. So it's really quite uh, complex. Um, we tried to do resolved Lyman alpha modeling to really see where Lyman alpha is produced. And we actually found that throughout this entire extended system of Lyman alpha emission, the line profile is quite constant. It's uh, this very clear uh, asymmetric red peak that's seen in the, in the left. The equivalent width of that line is about 100 angstrom, which is very high, but it's not impossible to explain that with uh, star formation, with a, a metal pore burst of star formation. Um, around this component B, which is actually quite a faint galaxy, we see good evidence for a second Lyman alpha emitting component um, on top of this extended Lyman alpha line from, the, from A. Um, it's a bit detailed, and I, I'm happy to answer questions on Slack on how we did this. But we did a uh, resolved Lyman alpha fitting, and we managed to fit the Lyman alpha profile with a two component model. Um, with one component that's really the dominant component that you can see on the left. This is just uh, the flux of that component. It's really, it's this elongated Lyman alpha halo that peaks at the UV, at the peak of star formation. And then there's a second thing on at component B. But even though you can see it quite clearly, note that I actually multiplied component two by, by 10. So even at that position, the extended emission from A uh, dominates. Um, and the extended emission is the last part that I want to discuss uh, for one minute. Um, similar to other studies that have been done with MUSE, um, you can 
try to model the extended lime and alpha emission with a combination of UV continuum like and uh, an exponential halo. And that's what we did. And we modeled that and we found that actually the majority of the lime and alpha photons are seen in this extended halo component, 70%. And you also see that the extended halo component is elongated in the, the direction of these other UV clumps. So this means that we see, we're see we seeing in this galaxy this complex structure where there are three uh, clumps of star formation uh, with, uh, with the ISM as well. But here we actually are seeing the gas in the circ circumgalactic medium that is nurturing these bursts of star formation. Uh, finally, regarding the profile of this extended emission um, shown in the data points here, um, this profile is actually extremely similar to normal lamina lamina alpha emitters after the epoch of reionization observed from use. Um, those are shown in red, and the red dashed line is just an example of a single object at redshift 4 that's rescaled at the same luminosity, and you can see this, the profile of the halo is very similar and within the uncertainties. So this is, seems to be consistent with this picture that the CGM of, of the, this galaxy so this very luminous lime and alpha emitted redshift 6.6 is similar to galaxies in the post reionization epoch. And it's actually a bit different from a stack of fainter lime and alpha emitters at the same time by Mamose et al. We measure a much shallower uh, halo scale length. So that could indicate that these the fainter lime and alpha emitters, their lime and alpha lines actually scatter more because their, um, their environment is more neutral compared to this bright uh, galaxy. Um, I'm just going to leave you here with my summary, but I want to end with a short outlook. Um, the image here, this, this is an IFU image of the Lyman alpha light. And of course, the outlook that we're all waiting for is, is, the, is how this, this galaxy and others are looking uh, when we observe them with the near spec IFU. And basically, the IFU has a field of view of three by three arc seconds. And um, if the Lyman alpha emission um, is actually produced in this halo uh, instead of scattering, we would see extended H alpha emission in the entire IFU of, of James Webb. So that's something uh, to think about, uh, to look forward to. And um, I'm really happy to answer any questions now or on the Slack uh, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yorit. Uh, we do have a few questions. So Sultan Hassan asks, to do the fitting with the shell model, what parameters did you vary and what are their best values? So we, when we do the line fitting, we do not use a shell model. Um, we use a, a, an asymmetric Gaussian, um, the skewed Gaussian. Um, but I, I can show those, those values on, on Slack. I think that's better. OK. Uh, Maxime asks, do you have the kinematics of clumps B and C with respect to clump A? And if so, are these infalling, like in a merger or outflowing? Um, we have. So clumps A and B are from carbon two, I think. That's the most, what he's referring to. Um, these are at the same redshift. So, so, sorry, clump B is at the same redshift as clump A. Uh, C is uh, redshifted with respect to it. Um, I, I actually have to check to, to, be, to be fully sure. Um, but um, I'll answer that on the Slack to be, to, make, to be sure I don't say anything that's wrong. Okay, um, and then a couple more. Do you? This is from John Chisholm. Do you see spatial live and alpha peak velocity shifts attributed to the major component? Uh, yeah, tentatively we do see that the this this uh, asymmetric uh, lime alpha line that's shown in the top left here becomes slightly the peak of that line becomes slightly redder towards the outskirts of the of the halo, which. Um, is um, similar to seen in some redshift three lime and alpha emitters, and could be due to resonant scattering. But um, the other thing is that at this component B, we see this faint lime and alpha emitting component, and that actually has a much larger uh, redshift with respect to the systemic than the main peak. The main peak is redshifted by 200 kilometers per second, this fainter component by about 400. Um, it's a bit challenging for that because there are actually two systemic redshifts at that position. So <laughs> you're not sure. <laughs> 